Good morning. Good morning. Is it on? Is it on? Okay. Get your Bibles and let's turn to the book of Judges. And we're going to do a little studying, look into the Word of God. At 2 o'clock today, we have a service at, what is it, Deborah? St. Luke. St. Luke. 215 Main Street at 2 o'clock. And so, uh, as many as can um, go with us there. Uh, there's a poem that I like, and the poem says, I'd rather want you to walk with me just to show me the way. Mm -hmm. And so we must learn how to be participatory in people's lives. Mm -hmm. Amen. Uh, I got a text a minute ago from somebody, and they said that they were not going to be here today because they were uh, their brother's children were uh, participating in something at another church. And I text them back and said, I'm glad that you went. Because your family is going to be there when these church folks are going home. And so uh, it's time for us to get some type of understanding about life. That's true. Uh, and a lot of what we do is just to please other folks. People really don't mean that. Really don't. And, uh, I think Deborah and I was talking. Rocky said in his last movie, Crystal, he said, "Time is under people." Mm -hmm. <laughs> Believe it or not, the young folks looking at us, all of us were crying at one time, <laughs> 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 to some degree or not. Yeah. It might not be as bad as you are, <laughs> but to some degree or not, at one time, all of us was crying. <laughs> but time is under people. <laughs> <laughs> And so then, uh, I'm in the mindset now to try to get some type of understanding of the so, And I know a lot of that, uh, it, it, I'm going to have to do away with people preaching. And, and, and some of it is the message that I want to talk to you about this morning. We've been, and this is probably the last message in that series, we've been in a series about uh, uh, pain. You see, pain... Uh, usually necessitates some type of action. <laughs> Folks said what they wanted, won't do, Crystal, but they just ain't been in enough pain. Right. Right. Uh, it broke my heart yesterday, the funeral, and I want to thank you, Manasseh, for how we continue to support one another. Amen. I'm more impressed. I'm more impressed by the support of each other than I am about you coming to church. Mm -hmm. Because Jesus said, it's not a uh, Jesus said that uh, by this shall all men know that you are my disciples, etc. By ye the love that you have for one another, That's right. the love you have, and and love. Uh, my definition of love is the ability to put other people's interests ahead of my own. Yeah. It's easy to talk love. And it's easy to front and all. It's green. Everybody that show you the teeth don't mean you're no good. But when you put, you know, we got that from our mother, didn't we? When we saw our mother walking around with, with, with a slip with holes in it in order that we could have that band uniform that we needed, and in order that we could have that book that we had, we, we knew that our mama was sacrificing. She, they, she was putting our interests ahead. That's when we really saw Love, and that's the reason no matter how she beat us, no matter how bad she talked to us, you could nobody make us believe she didn't love us because of her ability to put uh, our interests before hers. Amen. And, and so um, we're just very thankful for you, how you uh, support one another and you're there for one another. Uh, at the end of the funeral, Lady Deborah, when when, when, when Valerie's uh, sister cried out as they were closing the, the casket. And that, that's the reason I really like it when they don't open the casket back up. Because, you know, we have done all we know to do as ministers to, 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 to give you hope and to let you know that there is life past this. That, that death is necessary in order for you to transition to uh, the other side. There's no way... 
to be with Jesus except through death. And so he went through death for us in order to assure us and to take away the fear of death. Uh, but now after we have lifted you up and built you up and all that, now you open the casket and it's fresh. It's, it's like, have you ever had a, a wound or something, Mother Brewer? Mother, she said, I call it saying brew. That's not brew, Pastor, it's brewer. Uh, <laughs> Have you, ever, have you ever had a wound that it was healing finally and you was doing it and somebody messed around and, and hit that thing and opened it up back again? Looked like it was worse than when you first did it. And, and, and so it's kind of, to me, that's kind of how, I mean, I don't have, but it's just kind of like everything that you've done is out the window. And as they were closing the casket, one, one of the sisters just cried out. She said, Mama, 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 no. And you know, it just, I started crying. Be, be, because it's just hard, John. Pain. Pain necessitates, Tara, some type of action. You're going to do something. And a lot of what we've done that has harmed us is the remedies that we've gone to. Because there's a many things that make you feel good, Bennett, that's not good for you. So many things that make you feel good. It's not good for you. All of us like to be flattered. Yeah. All of us like to hear good things about ourselves. And so we are overdosing on that now because now we got social media and we got uh, uh, Facebook. We've got Instagram. We've got Twitter. And so folks that don't even know us, we got them talking about we like you. People wondering now how it is that they had 10,000 friends on Facebook but then before folk come to the funeral. Because they really don't know. They're not your friends. But we all want to be liked. We all want to be patted on the back. We all want to feel like that we are significant. And so we do something to take away the pain. And we've been in the, we have been in that series about painkillers. Uh, in one of the messages... I, the Lord gave me said, you know, they, they declared war on drugs. But what they should have done, Brother Gilbert, was declared war on pain. Because without the pain, there is I'm like the Baptist preacher. Did I say something? <laughs> with, with, without the pain, there is no need for the drugs. People don't just take drugs to be taking them. They take, I need those drugs. I need those drugs. I had a relative that was on their way up. They was doing well. They were doing fine, and they messed around and, and got injured and got in pain and started taking some Vicodins. Next thing they know, they're writing prescriptions and on their way to the penitentiary. I'm telling y'all something. Pain is something else. And so that's where, they, that's where y'all almost lost me at church. If I hadn't been just so religious, I would have just quit church. But my mom and them had put it in me so much, Dexter, that I was scared. I was scared not to come to church. But I know I wasn't getting nothing from it. I really felt better outside of church than I felt in. Because you were not addressing my needs. Okay, I'm saved. I'm saved, but I'm still hurt. I'm saved, but I'm still messed up. I'm saved, but I still got issues. And some of this stuff that I'm using that I know ain't right, I don't have another solution for it, so I got to do something. You ain't hurt. You know what? It's easy for you to talk to me when you ain't hurting. It's easy for you to tell me what I need to do when you not hurt. But when you start hurting, then you get a better understanding of why it is that I do what I do. So we've been in this series on painkillers. and It's probably the last message today. But what I want to talk about today, maybe last of all, is, is the pain, the pain of rejection. The pain of rejection. Why is that important? Because you still remember. You about 90 years old, you still remember. You still remember. You remember what was said to you? You remember how surprised you were? You remember how it hurt you that somebody that you loved when you found out they didn't love you? You remember how it felt when you were made to feel like that you were different. That you weren't the same, that you wasn't okay, that it wasn't all right. We're not, we're not going to hold you long. Judges, let's go, let's go Judges to, uh, where do we want to go? 
the 11th, 11th chapter. Yeah, Judges the 11th chapter and the first verse. Also, I'm having a, a, another birthday party tonight, and you're welcome to accompany me to that uh, in Memphis, Tennessee, uh, uh, celebrating 26, 20, 27, 27 years of sobriety. Yeah, I ain't saying nothing, but some more of these preachers need to thank you, Jesus. <laughs> Hey, don't let somebody was drinking. <laughs> some, more of, some more of them need to go, go to some meetings Amen. to get some help. But you know what? Uh, embarrassment and shame will keep you from getting some help. Yes. And then it, what the truth about it is, is that if it's to a certain point, everybody already know anyway. It, when it gets to a certain point, CJ, everybody knows. You'll be amazed how free you can get if you can get past your embarrassment. Because it ain't a dime worth a difference between none of us. Everybody, if they ain't on drugs, they got somebody that's on drugs. If they, if somebody that, that's attached to them is messed up. And so th th that is where our pain starts, Deborah. We start to feel that difference and we feel the rejection. And then we begin to hide. From who we are. Because you see what you do brother Benny. Is when you reject me. What you tell me in fact is. Is that who I am is not good enough. Do you remember when you felt like. That you was okay. Do you remember when you felt like. Wasn't nothing wrong with your nose. Until somebody told you. Boy you got a big nose. <laughs> you ain't never thought. Of, it's just a nose. It was, it was working fine for you. You could smell through it. Until somebody told you. That it was something wrong with the color of your skin, the shape of your head, the shape of your body, or, or whatever, what, you know. And anything, and it stay with you all your life. It stay with you all your life. They, they told my wife when she was coming up, they told her, they said, say, you're, you're a pretty girl, but you're shaped up like a white girl. <laughs> Y'all know what I'm talking about. <laughs> shaped up like a white girl. She about 70 years old. She still remember that now. <laughs> Don't you, baby? Hey, glory to God. But you see, the thing about it is, Mother Brewer, is that the thing about it was, it was somebody that God had prepared. Come on, preacher. That God first had to allow them to get thrown out of the University of Arkansas. Because he wasn't even coming to ASU. But God allowed him to get thrown out of the University of Arkansas and to show up right on time at ASU. And when he saw her, he didn't see nothing but a vision of beauty. When he saw her, he didn't see nothing. Let me tell you something. The repaying of the rejection was a tool of Satan that was meant to send you to a painkiller that was going to take you out. It never was nothing wrong with you because God created you just like you are. Never was nothing wrong with your body. Nothing wrong with your color, your skin. Nothing wrong with your end. Nothing wrong with you. Thank you, Jesus. That's the reason I implore you, I beg you, please cut them folks a loose. <laughs> That's always making you feel like that you less than. That always make you feel like, you know what, if you just was a little, if you just, if, cut them a loose. <laughs> Baby, God don't make no mess. God made me just like I'm supposed to be. I'm just where I'm supposed to be. I ain't late. I ain't early. I'm showing up. I'm doing just what I'm supposed to do. And when God get through with me, I'm coming forth at pure gold. My mess up didn't mess me up. It prepared me for the job that God... 
Sometimes people tell me, Dorothy, they tell me, say, you tell too much. I, I ain't got to be talking to them. I can be, I'm talking to all them up in their folks and everything, act like they, you know, judges and all them folks and everything and whatever. And I tell them, I said, well, you know, I used to say a dope. I used to smoke cocaine. They just looking in there, like, probably because they still smoking it. Um, <laughs> they don't fool me. You don't fool me. You see, because I know that except God helped you, I don't care how holy you look. I don't care how you try to walk around like you ain't doing nothing. And, and if God don't help you, ain't no telling what you might do. You better try to get some help and quit worrying about who, what these folks say or nothing. I'm going to every kind of meeting they got. Any, anything, anything, sex anonymous. Eat the y'all, oh, y'all, y'all ain't ready for that. Rejection will cause you to go find you a painkiller. Uh-huh. It'll cause you to go get an artificial remedy. And you really don't even have no problem at all. Baby, you just ain't my people. You just ain't my flavor. But, but it's something about a human being that we are cross paths, 99 folk that love us to get to one person who don't care about us. We gonna make this person care about us. We gonna make this person, we gonna argue, you got to see that I'm a, you, you got to see how good a person that I am. And the thing about it is they just don't care for you. You just don't float their boat. If you be honest, it's just some folks you don't like. They ain't never done nothing to you. It just, it, you just if you tell the truth, say, I just don't care for them. But it's all right. But you see, it never was about what you think, then it's about me. It's always been about what I think about me. Have you ever seen folks that look, they not that attractive, they ain't that smart, but they walk around like they all that in a bag of potato chip? They want, and then you find somebody else, you know, you want, here this woman is beautiful, got hair all down, and, and she's just perfectly sculptured and all that, and ain't got nobody. Ain't got nobody. Don't, know, don't nobody even want to be around. And it's because of who she projects, who she is. You see, my relief from rejection is not going to come from you. Have you ever been around folk like that? That they are so messed up that no matter how many times they're in it, and it's really bad to be married to somebody like that. They've been hurt, they've been rejected, and no matter how much you affirm them, they never believe that they're worthy to be loved because of the past hurt. I mean, let me get to the verse and let y'all go. Jeremiah, I mean not Jeremiah, I just, just, just Judges 11th chapter. 11th chapter. At least I did call a book that's in the Bible. <laughs> what that John, uh, uh, what, uh, what's, that, what's the guy's name that's running for president? Y'all next president, Donald Trump. Yeah. Donald Trump, he's talking, what he said, two Corinthians? Yeah. <laughs> I just love that book, two Corinthians. <laughs> <laughs> Judges chapter 11. What well, then my mama going to send me and leave me a message on my phone the other night going to talk about it. I didn't even respond. Randall, I just got through talking to somebody. They said there's two people in the world that's going to tell it just like it is. That's Donald Trump and you. I said, well, thank you. Mama. <laughs> Carl Ray tell me all the time. I said, man, ain't no hope for you. I'm looking at your mama. <laughs> Ain't no hope for you. I ask her sometimes, do you know you're 79 years old? Jesus. Judges to chapter 11. Let's go, y'all. Now, Jephthah the Gileadite was a mighty man of valor. And you see, what I learned is, is that you have to get to know your value. You sitting around waiting on somebody. Give me that thing. You uh, you're sitting around waiting on somebody to validate you. You're gonna be waiting for a long time. Because I found this out is that most people are so insecure that they don't have enough uh, uh, 
security within themselves to be able to say anything positive to you. Have you ever noticed that you can go to work and you know you're looking good? Your husband just bought you, I'm talking about a, a big old ring. Now, you know they see that ring. Won't nobody say nothing to you. They, they almost said, and you think like, I know. You don't, <laughs> you don't want to just say nothing to them. You just stand up there talking to them. <laughs> Doing all like that. Won't nobody say nothing in the world. But you see, the secret is, is that you have got to learn how to celebrate you. <laughs> My wife puts it like this, Brother Brown. She said, you got to learn how to pull your own little happy wagon. You're sitting around waiting on other folks to tell you how great you are or how good things are. But you got to learn how to pull your own. Let me tell y'all just a little story that, that I heard. There was this African village where everybody in the village was happy as they could be. And there was one, that this little boy, uh, Makumba, this little boy, he was the happiest person in the village. And whenever somebody would come to the village, because it was rich, fertile ground, and so people wanted to come so they could plant their and, their, and plant their uh, crops there, and they wanted to come so that their uh, uh, cows could graze there. And so whenever somebody would come, Cedric, to this little African village, they would all get together and they would play the drums and they would sing and, and they would welcome the people to this great village. And the head welcomer was Makumba. Makumba was the happy person and he would come out and he would welcome them to his village. And so on this very day right here, there was a new family that was seen on the horizon. It was a man, a woman, two boys, and a girl. And so, as they were wont to do, when these new family came, that they started to play the drums. And they began to sing and they began to dance. It's a new family that's coming to be with us. And as they came, of course, Makumba led the, led the group and Makumba ran up. And when he ran up and got ready to greet the people, they saw something was different. Because the man and the woman, the two boys and the girl, the one of the boys had a long burn mark all over his face. And down by his neck, there was a great big lump. And so Makumba kind of stepped back. And then he walked up. And he greeted the boy and the girl, but the boy that had the burn mark on him, he didn't greet him because he was terrified. He was different. He wasn't like the rest of the children. And so they welcomed the family, but nobody welcomed the little boy. And they brought him in and they took him out and they showed him the waterfalls and they showed the family the rich fertile land and they showed them, they, they did the dance for him and they played the drums for him. But the little boy was over there by himself. And so the next day the little boy took himself out and he showed himself the waterfalls and he showed himself the fertile ground and he showed himself the beauty of the ground while the rest of them uh, celebrated together. Then, Brother George, the next day, everybody was going about their business and they heard this beautiful melodic town. Dorothy, they heard the drums ringing and they saw, and everybody gathered because it was about noontime and the men were coming out of the fields and there was this boy that had this scar all over his face and there he was in the middle of the camp. They're dancing a dance more beautiful than they had ever seen. And he was singing a song like they had never seen. And they all wondered. They said that Makuma came up to him and asked him, said, man, what are you doing? He said, well, I'm welcoming myself. <laughs> you would think. Yes, he said, yeah, nobody welcomed me when I came here. Yes, and so now I'm welcoming yes, myself. Yes, I've got to learn how to find my own value yes, in order to get over the pain of rejection because this message is not for somebody else. This message is for you because no matter how wonderful you are, you could be Barack Obama, you could be uh, the child of a single mother whose, whose daddy died. You could be a child who, who was blessed to rise to the level that you went to Harvard and that you were on a, a, a law review. As a matter of fact, 
You were the editor of the Law Review from Harvard. Then you can go to Chicago and try to live to help people. And God can elevate you from that to the President of the United States uh, and can make you the Chief Commander in Chief. And as you stand in Congress, uh, there's somebody that can stand out and, and holler out, even in your position, that you are a liar. You will be rejected no matter where God put you. But you got to know who you are. You got to know for yourself of a surety. You can say what you want to say. You can talk about me how you want to talk about me. But I know that God put me where I am. And I am not standing on my own. I'm not boasting in myself. But I'm boasting in the God who put me here. So the Bible says that Jephthah the Gilead was a mighty man of God. Hold on just a second. Okay. He was a mighty man of God and he but, but look at this right here. He was the son of a harlot. Do you know what a harlot is? She was somebody who was hooked on painkillers. Because now she had a need in her life for financial gain and she met it the best way she knew. Now, folks, the same folks that came to her and paid her, after they paid her, they talked about her. But there's no way she could be a harlot without some of the good folks participating in it. So now you have this boy here. He has nothing to do with who his mother is. Some of your pain come from you being blamed for things you had nothing to do with. The color of your skin, who your mother was, who your father was. Uh, how you came here, the shape of your head, the shape of your nose, the shape of your body. And that's the reason I say uh, uh, I'm fortunate, Mother Brewer, that I live doing segregation. Because, see, when I live doing segregation, I looked at teachers that looked like me. I didn't have to worry about being different. I did not have to worry about being set aside or not talked to because I wasn't like you. Uh, when I was uh, in segregation, I saw people that looked like me in a position of authority. I saw people that looked like me make decisions. I saw people that looked like me that would look important. They had on suits and ties and they were in control. Them other folk did not even get involved in what was going on at our school. They didn't care what we did, didn't have how we did. And when that was going on, Sheila, we had folks that was coming out of there, going to all kind of schools, having all kind of, of scholarships, have, doing all kind of things. Because let me tell you something. This message here today is for me. Coming up on 60 years old, I'm going to tell you what. For how much you make, that kind of house that you live in, is not nearly as important as what you think about you. Oh yeah, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the, the devil is on a mission to make you think you ain't nobody. I don't care what you get, what the position is, how much you strive. Let me tell you something. I left here. God blessed me to get over cocaine addiction. Went back to law school. Uh, uh, here I am. And I get back here. The first year that I'm back here at this place, I think it was my 20 year class reunion. Uh, of the white folk, and I can talk like this because this is me. The white folk uh, had a separate reunion out at the country club, brother, brother Gilbert, to make sure you can't come out there. And I, I wrote a letter to the editor of the Daily World. I said, here it is, 20 years later. We supposed to be integrated. We were the second class integrated. Never have been integration. 20 years later, and you make your decision, not based on whether I married, not whether I raised my children, not whether I sent my children to college, not whether I, I'm, I'm a good church member, not whether I'm a good citizen. I've gone off to the U.S. Army and served 10 years. I've been, a, been an officer in the Army. You make your decision not based on none of that. 
Your decision as to whether you want to deal with me is based simply on the melanin that's in my and them facts. Those are facts. You take it like you want to take it. Ain't nobody had nothing to say to this day. So now, I got to quit waiting on you to have some sense. And I got to have some sense. Let me tell you something. The thing about pain is, is that if you never deal with pain the right way, you become a pain dodger. You become a pain dodger. You ever know, you know folks like that in your family? That whenever you want to bring up the real issues about the family, they, 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 they dismiss you. And it's bad when that person is the head of the family. We never get chance to deal with that. I told my mama, she was talking about me, I said, I said, I said, baby, I'm the only child you got you really know. <laughs> the other folk just telling you what you want to hear. Everything ain't nice. My daddy told me this, he says, he said, look, the truth will make you free, but it's going to hurt you first. It's going to hurt you first. The Bible says here that Jephthah was a mighty man. Mighty man. But he was the son of a harlot. And Gilead begot Jephthah. And Gilead's wife bare him sons, and his wife's sons grew up. And they thrust out Jephthah and said unto him, Thou shalt not inherit in our father's house. She ever been told that what you can't have? It's just rejection. I wouldn't play this church game with the folks, and you, I'm telling you, the things that they tried to do to me, but Benny, they tried to take my wife and put my wife over me. And these are the same folks that come to me now and want to grin in my face. But I'm going to tell you what, I'm not that needy anymore, Crystal. I really don't need you. I don't need your friendship. Because you are no friend. You don't care for me. You don't care for me. I was in court Friday and everything, and my clients were, uh, were uh, asking me this and asking me that. And this is the only answer I had to say for them. I said, I cannot tell you. I said, you don't have no crystal ball? I don't have no crystal ball. I can't tell you what's going to come up, but I can tell you this. Whatever come up, I stand up to it. Amen. And that's just my attitude about it now. I don't allow you to tell me where I can go, who I am, and what I can do. Amen. What I can do. Let me tell you this. My son is dealing with it now because he's, he's, he's practicing law now. If your, if your skin color is like this, it's something about other black folk. Even though you went to the same school that the other folk went to, you took the same box. I, when I went to school, I was in the top third in the class. What that means is, is that even after using cocaine for all them years, I still did better than two-thirds of the folks at the law school. Okay? I graduated top third. I passed two bar exams on the first time. Okay? But still, I have to live with the understanding that nine black folks out of ten think them white folks got more sense than I got. I'm that preacher. I don't care about how y'all look at me. I ain't preaching for money. I'm preaching to help you. I'm preaching to tell you what you're going to have to deal with in reality after that you have sweated, after you have done everything you know to make your life better, you still going to have to deal with rejection. And how are you going to deal with it? Yeah. Are you going to deal with it with drugs and alcohol, with illicit sex? Are you going to deal with it by becoming bitter and becoming angry? Or are you going to let God's love flow through you? Yeah. Are you going to believe God and say, God, you know what? My life never was in another man's hand. He said, ever since I got here, God, you have taken care of me. I never missed a meal. I, I, I never thank you, Jesus. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Somebody testimony is, is that we weren't rich. We didn't have everything, but God made a way for us. Some kind of way. Never been a day we didn't have a roof over our head. Never been a day that God didn't feed us. Never been a day that God didn't lift my head. Not everybody, but just somebody know what I'm talking about. Look at your neighbor and tell him, say, my head has been low, but God lifted it. My head been low before, but my God lifted up my head. 
I don't care nothing about you. No, I tell anybody. My head been low. But I'm glad. I'm glad I had a praying mama. I had an example. I had somebody that I, when things got rough, <laughs> I tell y'all about that time that that man came down there to get that old raggedy trailer house <laughs> down in Elaine, Arkansas. I'll never forget it. I thank God. You know what? It, it, it is not the mountaintop experiences that make me. It's down in the valley. If I ever want to get encouraged, I think about where God brought me from. And I can remember Mother Brace, I remember how the man's face looked. Here we are. My mama got five little children coming to the door. And here my daddy is off in Starksville, Mississippi. Supposed to be going to school. But he's fighting alcoholism. He's fighting the pains of life. He's fighting. That's all he knew to do because uh, was to get a bottle. Because life was just too painful for him. I understand that now. I hated him at the time for it. Huh? But I understand that when you don't know what to do with your pain, huh? ain't no telling what you might do. Yes. Brother Brown, I remember that man coming to the door and my mama coming to the door and my mama pleading with that man. Huh? She said, please, I'll try to get the money. Please, don't, don't, don't take this. all we got. Uh, the trailer house, the ragged is, they, they should have gave it to us. Huh? But... <laughs> You had to watch when you walk around because the vents and stuff, you can fall through them and all kind of stuff. Thank you, Jesus. The man told us there ain't nothing we can do for me. And he, he turned and he left. But now, it must have been just like when uh, uh, Isaiah told Hezekiah, get your house in order. <laughs> Hezekiah turned, and I don't know what my mama did, but she must have done like Hezekiah. She must have turned her face.